I'm well, thank you. Thanks for calling in. Thanks for calling in. So excited for you. First year of being an author. Let's talk about your experience. Absolutely. Well, let's see. I started, um, as you said, it's been just a little more of a year ago, and I kind of happened upon it. It wasn't as if I planned to write a book. As a matter of fact, it only took me about five weeks to complete the whole book. Um, once I started writing the chapters and the stories just kept coming and faster and faster that it was almost like I couldn't even sleep. So um, it was just really an incredible story that I love to share because I've, I've learned so much about myself in this process. Wow, so it only took you five weeks to write the book? Five weeks to write the book. This It was happening so fast. like. I could wake up at three in the morning and just write till nine or 10 o'clock. Just, it, it was like, I didn't even need a break. I didn't need to eat anything. I didn't need to drink anything, no distractions. It was just coming so quickly and um, I had to capture it because I'd never physically or mentally experienced anything like that to where I just had to surrender to it. So it was definitely um, an interesting experience. Well, I've started writing years ago in my journals and my diaries, and I have this amazing uh, creative mind that I could put stuff together and, you know, see this huge picture of something, and I could talk about it. Um, so I've probably for years, but I didn't know what it was because I didn't qualify qualify myself as a writer simply because I was also a big reader. So when I was reading other authors, they were in a place of existence that was unknown to me, so I could never see myself as a writer, I guess. So, um, but I've definitely written for years, and um, I'm a huge reader. I always read. Nice, nice. Now let everybody know the title of your book. Okay, the first book is called The Virtues of Joy, and um, it's a compilation of short stories. And the second book is called More Virtues of Joy, another compilation of short stories. Um, the second book came about because the readers of the first book, were they just wanted more stories. And it was like, you've got to write another book. You've got to write another book. So I sat down to try to tap into that same level of eroticism and expression to see if I could come up with book number two. And I did, less than a year later. Okay, and let's talk about being self-published. How do you like it so far? Um, I'm enjoying it. It's definitely a, a place that I can be as an adult because if I were younger, I wouldn't be able to do this because there's a lot of managing, a lot of parts to manage, and it's like having your own thing. You, if it doesn't sell, you're responsible for that. If it doesn't look great, you're responsible for that too. So there's not a team of people working on it. It's Literate, literally my expression of self, my creative expression to put it out there however I see it. And I've, I've learned a lot from working with Kendall and uh, Create Space and Barnes and Nobles and Ingram Sparks. So I've really learned a lot about the business of book publishing, um, which has put me in a great position to now publish for some other people. So definitely increased my sense of who I, who I am. Nice, nice. Now let's talk about the first book. Okay. Uh, give the listeners some idea what the first book covers. Well, the book, the first book is um, short stories. So there's 10 short stories and they're all based on a virtue. So the interesting thing about that is um, in writing the book, because I didn't really know I was writing a book, so I didn't have a title, I didn't have an end plan in mind. I didn't have a cover, like in my mind, none of that happened because I, I wasn't writing a book. So once I started writing the stories and they're very kind of, um, as I said before, they're sexy, they're fun, and witty and erotic. I'm writing the stories, but I couldn't figure out, 
what was the point of the stories? Like, how do you get somebody to read something? Like, what's the point? And I literally just had to kind of um, start thinking about how do I package this? What do I do with it? And so each short story is based on a virtue and it's about a character named Joy and she is single and free spirited and trying to figure out how to balance her carnal desires with being a good girl, right? So the stories are written and then it was like, well, how is she a good girl? What is it about the stories? What does she exude in the story that still says, I'm a good girl and I believe in God and God takes care of me and how do you manage that? You know how it is in society. People want to put you one way or the other, but to be successful in yourself, you have to have a balance of those things. So each story is connected to a virtue. Um, there's a virtue of courage and optimism, generosity, which is one of my favorites, and fairness and love. So. Um, just a lot of just they're fun stories to read. Nice, nice, nice. I wonder if we could get you to read one of the stories or one of your shortest stories. Oh, would you like me to read a piece now? Sure, you feel good about it. Oh, no. yes, awesome. <laughs> I'd love to. You're like speaking my language, yes. So, um, do you did you have a chance to look at the book to see which virtue you'd be interested in me reading a part of? Yes, I'm just not sure which one is the shortest one. Okay. Whatever one you think is the shortest, be crazy. Okay, well, I don't have to, I won't read the whole thing. I'll just read some a couple pieces of it. Do you have a, um, so I'll just read a couple pieces, like just that I've shared before. Um, so uh, I'll do that. So let's see. Okay, so let me give you some, I'll give you some background to this. Uh, this is the virtue of generosity. It's one of my favorites. And it's about Joy is going to visit her friend Kendall at a house party. So there's going to be oysters there. It's going to be some single people. They're just going to go hang out and cook, eat some oysters and drink some beer. So um, once Joy gets to the house, her intention from the beginning of the virtue is that she is definitely in need of some attention. Like she wants some attention. She's seeking some attention from someone and that's what her goal is for the evening. So um, I'll start reading now. So uh, I got his name later, but for now, let's call him seven. Lucky number seven, we saw each other. I heard Kendall say, Jay, you want a Stella or Tito's? I kept looking at seven. I said, Give me a second. I'm going to have some chocolate first. I guess she just looked to see that Seven and I had each other's attention because she said, Oh, okay. Well, I'm pouring you a shot of Tito's. I reached into my purse to pull out a chocolate square, but I never took my eyes off Seven. I opened the chocolate, held it up, and said to him, Would you like to share this with me? His smile was slight. He moved closer to fill the space between us. Well, when he was close enough, I took the chocolate square and inserted half of it in my mouth, my teeth holding it in place to allow his half to stick out. I noticed that he's not much taller than me, a couple or three inches maybe. His skin is the same complexion as this chocolate that's starting to melt against my tongue. It's warm and sweet. I wonder if he tastes the same. He's standing in front of me in my space and he feels good in it, but he hasn't taken his half of the chocolate. So of course I start thinking, is this too much? Should I break it and let him take his share? Well, I lifted my head to alter my view. It was then that he leaned in to get his chocolate. He was waiting for me to lift it to him as an offering. By now, the piece on my tongue was melting and thick, mixing with my saliva. Well, Seven opened his mouth. Instinctively, my eyes closed. I felt his lips touch mine. My expectation was that he would bite his chocolate and step back. I mean... What should I expect of a stranger to whom I've offered to share a piece of chocolate out of my mouth? Well, he bit his piece, but he didn't move. Turns out he wanted my half too. He continued, he must really like chocolate. He licked the chocolate residue from between and on my teeth. I let him have it. He wanted more. So I opened wide and allowed him to get all that he could from the depths of my mouth. I didn't tell him that I had more chocolate in my purse. <laughs> I wanted him to continue to explore my mouth looking for more. Well, unprompted, I reached up to place my arms around his neck. He responded by enveloping me in his arms. Our chocolate mission has turned into passion. 
This kiss was the sweetest, softest form of an introduction. I became aware before he did, but I heard Kendall's babe say, do they know each other? She said, I don't think so, but they will. I didn't move, but I lowered my eyes and attempted to change the position of my arms. Well, Seven pulled me closer. He wanted my arms to stay. I put them back and looked into his face. We haven't said hi yet, and we still didn't. Hi wasn't enough of a greeting for this moment. My body is awake. I felt my nipples pressing at the t-shirt and thought, damn, I should have worn a bra. Reading my mind, he loosened his grip, freed one of his hands, then effortlessly slid it under my t-shirt and rubbed his thumb across my nipple. I inhaled deeply and my eyes rolled in response. I could feel his hardness pressing against my thigh. Breathe. I felt like I couldn't get enough air. He started breathing with me, guiding me, calming me. I don't believe that either of us knew what was going on. Well, maybe I was at an advantage because this morning when I awoke, I knew that I needed something more than the pleasure of my own fingers to assist in the release of this pent up energy. Hmm, with that thought, correction, I do know what's going on. I'm placing myself on the altar for his taking. Let me show him. While looking in his eyes, I press my body into his. I reposition my hand on his neck, holding it firmly. I part my lips and lean in to kiss him, hard and hungry. I had to show him that I wanted to give myself to him. He responded by removing my hand from his neck and forcefully pushing it along with my arm behind my back. He held it there and returned the hungry but harder kiss. He was showing me that he was in charge of this moment. Fuck it, that's cool with me, take me. Keep in mind, we are in an apartment with several people. Music is playing, laughter and conversations, oysters are being shucked, regular house party shit is happening all around us. Seven and I are oblivious to it all. Nothing exists but the time and space within us. When he starts walking forward, holding my arm behind my back, I hold on to him tighter with my free arm to keep from falling. So he's walking forward. That means I'm walking backwards and kissing at the same damn time. We stop. I feel something pressing against my calf. Is that a couch? It was a convertible air sofa bed. I don't know the correct name, but it seems like a piece of furniture acquired for a bachelor's first apartment. Well, Seven turns us around. He sits on the sofa bed thing and pulls my arms for me to follow. I do. I lay on him. His legs are open and my legs are together between his. More kissing, more touching. My body is pressing against his. Oh my Lord, thank you for gravity, pressure, force, everything responsible for allowing me to feel this man underneath me. My legs wanted to open. I couldn't stop them. One at a time, they parted ways to straddle this man. I could feel his dick pressing against my pussy. Ugh, I struggle with that word, but in this moment, it's so appropriate. I've straddled him. We're kissing. I'm grinding through my leggings into his jeans. I wanted this man to fuck me right now, but not right here in this open space of people. Well, because my body loves itself, it began to work on releasing this orgasm. Slow grinding, rocking, kissing with Seven. I could feel it. Faster, I moan. I'm going to come. Seven took his hands and held my hips in place. He stopped my explosion. Hell, I no longer cared who was in the room. This mission was selfish, or so I thought. Is that enough? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was good. And let everybody know where they can find you at on social media. Well, I'm on Facebook, uh, Joycelyn Wells Moore. That's where I am on Facebook. I'm on Instagram at Joycelyn Wells. Um, I have a YouTube, Joycelyn Wells Shape. So Shape is self-help and personal empowerment. So S-H-A-P-E. So I'm on YouTube that way. Um, but Facebook and Instagram are my go-to social media platforms. Um, my books are available, and so am I, on my website um, at uh, uh, thevirtuesofjoy.com. There are several that lead to the same place, but thevirtuesofjoy.com. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to read one more before I let you go. Okay. I'm going to ask you, what was your biggest challenge with writing a book? My biggest challenge with writing the book was actually to be to be open to the truth that was flowing from my body. That was my biggest challenge because 
I've always been very reserved about me and the way that I do things. And I've always been very kind of private with my sexuality. So when I started writing, um, and it's so funny the way that it started, because I actually asked someone to come and give me a bath. And he came and gave me a bath. And um, that's all he did was give me a bath. And it was such an erotic, overwhelming experience that I started writing about it. And that was the first thing that I wrote. And that virtue is in the first book. I finished it and completed that for the first book. So when I started writing and these thoughts were coming to my mind and they were flowing effortlessly, I had to be okay with the fact that I was ready to allow that transparency of the woman that I am. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that was my biggest challenge was not trying to sweeten it up or cover it or like try to make me out to make the character out to be different. It was just allow this character to be released and just to allow yourself to be transparent. There's no reason to hide anymore. There's nothing to be afraid of. No one's going to stop you from moving forward. Like you know, those little things, you got your parents, and then I was married, and I had my ex-husband. You know, you got your kids, so we're always trying to live in a box. But this just allowed me to be free, to reach a platform of freedom that I had never known, and just to trust it. So that's definitely the most difficult part of writing the book. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. We do need one more. Are you ready to read one more? Oh, sure. Ready to go. I will. You know what? I'm going to read a part of Patience. That's about the bath. So I'll read a bit about that. And um, that was a lot of fun. I'll read the intro to it because it's really just a, a great story. Um, so I'll read the beginning and then it'll get to the bath part. So let's see. Here we go. Okay. So... This is patience, the virtue of patience. Each virtue is listed at the beginning of the story with also a definition of the virtue to kind of help you to frame your thoughts about what's about to happen. So here we go. Last night, I took a bath, a long, lingering, steamy hot bath. Funny, because I rarely spend time actually taking a sit-down bath. I don't know why. Time-consuming or showering is more convenient. Hmm, not really sure, but I have to say that last night I thoroughly enjoyed it. As I'm sitting here thinking about it, trying to gather the words to paint a picture for the reader of this entry, the first thing I need to correct is the opening statement. Here goes. Last night, a bath was drawn, steamy and hot, and then my beautiful towering man guest bathed me. Before I get into the details, let me paint his picture. Anyone who knows me know that I love, love, love big men. I don't even have an answer as to why, I just do. For the sake of continuing this entry and anonymity, let's call him Ghost. He has to have a name. <laughs> now I'm laughing to myself because the diminutive of Ghost fits him. He's about 6'4", possibly 300 pounds. He actually mentioned that he's put on a few pounds here lately. Perfect. His skin is like creamy dark chocolate. He has a strong jawbone. With kind eyes, he's wearing his head shaved with a kick-ass salt-and-pepper beard. Some background. Ghost and I met at an event years ago. He saw me, I saw him. We started trying to figure it out without even speaking a word. When we got close enough to each other, brief conversation ensued. I told him to come to my room that, unfortunately, I was sharing with hella chicks. Honestly, I wanted to get him alone, to hold his dick in my hand and possibly feel it on my lips. Now he didn't know this, he might have hoped for something like this, but he didn't know what was going on in my mind. Once I got him to the room, we had to go to the bathroom, and if the other couple that was in the bathroom with us is reading this, this is your shout out. Ghost looked at me, I took his hand and pulled him with me. I sat down on the toilet, seat lid down, kind of motioned for him to come closer. He obliged. I looked up at his face as he was still standing, and I proceeded to unbuckle his belt. Admittedly, he was thrown off. He was looking back at the other couple and then down at me. All the while, I never took my eyes off his face. Finally, I had his belt unbuckled, his pants unfastened and unzipped, his fly open on his boxer and my hand inside holding his dick. Full, thick, heavy, warm dick. I promise you, my mouth started watering. So I'm looking at him. We have some serious eye contact now. 
Hell, I believe we both forgot that there were other people in the bathroom with us. <laughs> this is too funny. I'm waiting on a nod or something in his face to give me a silent permission to unveil the surprise. Then it happened. He moved ever so slightly, almost as if he were making room for his dick to make an entrance. By now, of course, his rock hard, bulging, throbbing, and hot in my hand. I tried to pull it through the boxers, but I couldn't. Too anxious, maybe. With his left hand, he gently removed my hand from the boxer open, opening and continued holding me at my wrist. While he pulled his boxers down with his right hand, this beautiful, oh so beautiful dick made its grand entrance. The sight of it literally took my breath away. He then placed my hand on the wrist he was holding within reach. After I looked at it, touched it to my nose just to inhale his maleness, rubbed it across my lips, I opened my mouth, inserted his dick, and began a slow, powerful, sucking motion. Did I mention already that I didn't know him from Adam? I was obviously out of my mind. So as I'm sucking his dick, and I mean good too, like I'm trying to draw the essence of him inside of me, I notice movement out of the corner of my eye. People are standing at the door watching me suck his dick. Okay, yeah, right. Now I'm aware and embarrassed. I came to my fucking senses. I asked myself, am I honestly sucking this man's dick with an audience? I looked at him. He looks as if he's caught between, please don't stop and is this a problem? <laughs> I'm too tickled thinking about that night. At my suggestion, we fixed ourselves, even as, even as the audience protested. As we left, he said, let me get your number. I gave it to him. When we parted ways, he said, what's your name? I was so fucking embarrassed that I just kept walking. Anyway, as chance meetings go, we texted a bit. We even crossed paths at a few events. He finally got the nerve to ask again. What's your name, he said. I've had you saved as the one since that night. I giggled and gave him my real name, Joy. All of that background so that we can talk about the bath. I was on a flight coming into Atlanta on Saturday. For whatever reason, goes crossed my mind. I haven't seen or talked to him in a year easy. Well, once my plane touched down, I sent him a text as soon as I took my phone off airplane mode. It was pretty simple. Me, hey, what's going on? Ghost, nothing, chilling, sitting here. What you up to? Me, I'm gonna have a drink. Ghost, where are you, who are you with? Me, I'm near the airport, I'm alone. Minutes passed, fucking crickets. Me, I'd like for you to come give me a bath. Ghost. Okay, send me the address. I'll be there in an hour. And that, dear friends, is how the evening began. Of course, I went downstairs to the hotel restaurant to have drinks and dinner before his arrival. Surprisingly, I wasn't even nervous. It was as if I had had a personal bather my whole life. I did, however, spend some time conjuring up his image. I wondered about his looks, how did he smell, and oh my goodness, I surely hope his dick is as thick as I remember. You know the mind can be quite creative. So over the next 15 minutes or so, there were some text messages and then he arrives. Okay, so I'm just fast forwarding a little bit. So I'm in the mirror dancing to Jill Scott when there's a knock, knock, knock at the door. Oh shit, chick, it's time. Don't your trash talking ass panic now. That's what I said to myself. I took a deep breath, went to the door, opened it, looked straight at ghost chest and lifted my eyes until they met his and in my mind said, Hell yeah, this N-word is everything. My exterior was cool and collected, though. My mouth said, hi, ghost. He said, the one, then laughed a big laugh and said, it's about damn time. We hugged and laughed. He poured us drinks. I had mine straight, no rocks, no chaser. His had a splash of cranberry. We sat in the sitting area of the hotel and talked about who the hell knows what and listened to music. As if moved by an unknown force while in mid-sentence, I stood, smiled a slight smile, excused myself to the bathroom where I proceeded to look at my face in the mirror. I believed I was searching for fear or anxiety or for my mouth to utter an excuse or reason to giggle and say, I was just playing, no bath for me. It wasn't there. Instead, my reflection was cool, calm, and assured. Instead of turning away, I stared, stared at myself and began to undress as if exploring the depth of my own eyes and the fullness and curves of each part of my body as if it was unveiled for the first time. I was lost in a moment of self-appreciation. As I breathed a slight sigh at the touch of my own fingers, I noticed movement in the mirror. It was him, ghost. My first thought was how long it had been standing there. 
Laughing nervously to myself, I covered my breast with my right arm, hand over my left nipple while pressing my forearm to shield the right. He just stood there. We locked eyes in the mirror. No words, no eye movement. We stared. I have no idea what either of us was thinking, or even if we were thinking. Is this a staring contest, or are we willing the other to make a move? Something moved between us, causing him to step forward. It was a force, an energy, or something. And I, in all my naked glory, thought he was coming to me. I inhaled a deep breath, closed my eyes, and braced myself. I felt the gentle movement of the air around me, and then I heard the sound. Not the music lightly traveling from the front room, but a soft gurgling, pure, fresh, and the air changed slightly. I still stood untouched. What is that? Yes, oh yes, the bath water. I smiled, remembering I asked for a bath. Okay, how about that? <laughs> love it, love it, love it. <laughs> I told you there's so much fun. The stories are so much fun that when I do readings, for, I'll go and do readings for people, probably like 8 to 10 or 8 to 12 people, and they're so captivated by the openness of this woman expressing it that the readings will that are scheduled for like an hour and a half will last for three, four hours. Like they want more. They want to ask questions. It's almost like people are looking for a way to be okay with things that they've done. Gotcha. Yeah, so it, it's a lot, so much fun. Um, the stories are fun. The, and when I said I was writing a book, when I figured it out, I was like, okay, the women will love it. But you know what? My biggest audience, men, men love the stories. Yep, men love the stories. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to buy this for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm actually going to I'll be on a cruise ship in October for this event called um, Masquerade 2018. It's uh, out of the port of Miami, and I'm reading on the cruise ship to the people who are attending the Masquerade 2018 cruise. So... It's um it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it a lot. Nice, nice, nice. How, how long is the cruise ship for? It's gonna leave on Friday, and it's an overnight Friday to Bahamas, overnight in Bahamas, and comes back on from Friday to Monday, from October 12th to October 15th. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So that's it's nice. fun. Yeah. So um, we have a lot of people who, and believe it or you probably know because you work in radio and you get to talk to so many people that a lot of people have a lot of hangups about who they are and what their desires are. So I really get a lot of women and men opening up, trying to get some understanding about things that they've done or things that have happened to them because you never really get to talk to somebody that's just open about their experiences and embracing them for goodness. So that's another thing about the books. There's not any bashing of the opposite sex. There's not any, he ain't this. And it's none of that. It's all good stuff because the whole point of being free is not to collect any baggage, right? So the whole point is you go in a situation, you take the good from it, and then you walk away from the situation. You don't make it baggage, you don't make it nasty, you don't make it evil, and um, and a lot of people, that's what they know, so when they don't know that they can enjoy who they are without being subjective to somebody else's scrutiny, They're, they just don't know that they can. Very good point, that's a very good point, more people need to hear that, get rid of that baggage, very yep. good point. Yep, absolutely. So that was a big deal for me because I was married for years, uh, 17 years, and it took me some time to not to stop blaming my ex-husband. But the funny thing is I didn't stop blaming my ex-husband until I broke up with my boyfriend after my ex-husband, right? So then I was kind of like, wait a minute now. You keep ending up in these crappy relationships. It's got to be you. <laughs> like, I got to be the problem. So I started doing a lot of introspection, right? Like, what is it in me that's drawing me to these situations? So my ex-husband is a brilliant man. He's a brilliant thinker, phenomenal thinker, and he is who he is. The guy I dated after him for a few years, he is who he is, but I wasn't being who I am. So now that I'm being who I am and I can look at everything openly with clear eyes, I probably wouldn't have dated either one of them. <laughs> 
with my grown up eyes, you know, it's like, huh, yeah, no, but uh, they're great, you know, so whatever. But I think that's a big deal for people that when you enter in situations, you take, people have a limited amount of resources to give to you. And what we tend to do as women is to try to hold on to them to get more resources, not realizing their resources for us specifically have been depleted. So people stick around for obligation and they feel like I got to because we've been together so long and it's just tearing everybody apart emotionally, mentally, and it's just not a good thing. So you have to recognize when the love is over, when whatever the offering is has been depleted and walk away from it and stop trying to force it to be something that it's not, that it'll never be. Now how do you know when the love is over and when to walk away? Um, I think that the thing you have to be open about who you are in the situations and you have to respect who you're with. If if your partner, uh, one of the things that comes up all the time is about men cheating, a men cheating or women cheating. I'm not going to do like a sexual bias. Men cheating or women cheating. Guess what? I'm not running behind a man to say, you better not cheat on me or chasing him down or chasing somebody down. You really kind of have to step back and watch the path that people are traveling. If he has desires someplace that doesn't include you, it's then, well, include me, I'll use myself. It's my responsibility to walk away from it, to save me the grief. Because I'm a firm believer, when an adult person makes a decision to do something, it's what they wanted to do and they enjoyed it, right? So I'm not going to make... I can't make somebody's good time a bad time because I can't recognize I need to walk away from the situation. So when people have these experiences, when they're in the relationship and it's good, it's good. But a lot of times those are momentary interactions and something that's not supposed to be sexual, we make it sexual. And then we think because we've made it sexual, it's supposed to last. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes it's only supposed to be sex. Sometimes you meet somebody and you're hot and bothered and let's get it on and you get it on and then you look at each other tomorrow and realize I have absolutely nothing to talk about with you. <laughs> but instead of saying, wow, that was great, see you later, we start trying to, well, let's go to a movie and let's eat dinner and why don't you spend the night and you start trying to force these societal norms in a situation that they shouldn't be. And that's not a good thing. So you you just have to, you got to know yourself when it's done, it's done. Like, and that's a, it's a good place to be because a lot of times men definitely respect it in women. Men, any man that I've ever dealt with over the course of my life, I have a total, res we have a respectful relationship right now that there's not any evil anything because I'm not going to allow it for one and then they're kind of like, well, hell, she was honest. <laughs> so <laughs> she was she was straightforward and she was honest. So it's really, it's just interesting. I think you know when you just, you pay attention to the other person enough. And if it doesn't feel good, it's not going to start feeling good again. It just doesn't feel good. You have to trust yourself. Good point, good point. I definitely got to bring you back for another interview. Read more of your book and talk more about your stories. That would be great. Absolutely. I'd love that. And you can let your listeners know that I travel all over the United States and outside of the United States, too. I'm really just trying to sell my book. But if someone's interested in having um, me to come and do a reading and a book signing, it could be a book club. It could be at their home with friends, the local library whatever it is they're trying to do to you know have something different just to have a dialogue of you know grown-up moment i'm open to that and i can be reached as i said on my uh website thevirtuesofjoy.com facebook i'm very open so um, people send me emails and stuff all the time so i'm very open to sharing you know this experience because it's really a great journey for me as a woman to just recognize situations not to walk into because I'm comfortable enough with who I am to say it's not even worth me doing that so I, lo I love sharing that with women so and men so awesome and where can they buy your book from 
Well, they can get it off my website from me, or they can, it's also available on Amazon.com, thevirtuesofjoy.com, and more virtues of um, my website, virtuesofjoy.com. So Amazon, The Virtues of Joy, and also Barnes and & Nobles. And um, a lot of people don't use Kobu, but it's on Kobu too. But those two places and my website are the go-to places for my books. If they want to autograph, and I just started a promo today, if they want to autograph, copy and wrapped and sent to them for a Mother's Day gift, then I will I can do that, order it through my website, I'll autograph it for them and mail it directly to them. It's a flat fee of um, $20, so they can order it from me, I'll send it, drop it in the mail to them. So, and that's another thing, oh you know that, because I sent one a book to you, I gift wrap every, uh, every book that I send, I gift wrap, I gift wrap it, yeah. It's a big deal for me. It's like I'm sharing a piece of who I am. So I take the time to just let the person know who's receiving it, that this is a very special moment we're sharing. So I definitely, um, that's a priority for me to wrap every single book that I send, that I send out. But if it goes from Amazon and Barnes and Nobles, then it's not gift wrapped and it's not autographed. But from me, from my home to yours, I definitely take great care with them. Well, we'd like to thank you again for calling on. I want you to hold on for one second. Okay. I'm going to do a quick commercial break on Downtown Hot Radio. Awesome.